Hello, friends. Hello. How are you guys doing? Good. <laughs> you know, I realized as I was walking up here, uh, I don't know why I ask for all of this stuff. Like, I don't ever use this. I never sit down, do I? And what do I put on here? Really nothing. But it's kind of like having a blanket, like a little baby blanket. Like, as long as my things are here, I'll be okay. I won't be as nervous. No. Uh, my name is Brianna. I'm a family member here at Woodland Hills. And it is so lovely to be back with you. Uh, sharing a message of the Lord. So thank you for welcoming me back. I'm so, so honored to be here. I really am. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks. Um, and as you guys know, I will say this probably every time I preach until you get so sick of me saying it, but what do I like? I love dialogue, right? We do things in community and we preach sermons in community and with your dialogue, with your hallelujahs and your amens, my friends, that's how we do things around here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Plus it makes me less nervous, so... Uh, there's that. I'll just put it all out there. Okay, so we are in this sermon series right now. We started it last week, and it's called Women on the Outside. Now, before I begin, how gnarly is it that we get to be a church that devotes five weeks to stories of women in the Bible who are cast to the margins? I know. I love that. I love that. And, and the reason why we believe this is important, because for much of our history, um, and especially as we read through the Bible, we see that the scriptures of story are the story of scripture is written from a very patriarchal lens. Women really had no place in society, right? Women were cast to the margins. And for generations upon generations, women were considered second-class citizens. They had no voice. They had no role in society. And oftentimes, uh, um, the message of God is spoken of and through a, a male lens primarily. But, but what we see with the Christ event, what we see with Jesus coming, is something a little bit different, what we see Jesus doing is not just bringing the kingdom more fully, but we see Jesus saying like, man, I know society has for generations cast women to the outside, but I'm going to go to them and I'm going to bring them on the inside because they are my daughters and because they matter and because to fully represent the kingdom, we need both male and female on the inside doing my work. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And it's also pretty rad that I happen to be a lady, so I dig that. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, so today's sermon that we're going to be focusing on is a story of, of not just one woman, but two. Two sisters, Martha and Mary. And if I may confess, do you guys mind if I confess something to you? Is that okay? Um, <laughs> it's really not that big. But I was kind of bummed about like, having to preach on Martha and Mary. Uh, not because I don't think their story is important, but because really, how many times have we heard the story of Martha and Mary? And I was thinking, like, Jesus, what more could be said? It's already been said. But I believe the word of the Lord is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. And so it will always bring something new. And it will always bring us new light. And it will always, if we allow the Holy Spirit to let it, it will always make us more into the image of God. And so with that, I was like, all right, I can do this. I can do this. And if you guys know anything about me, I am a ferocious researcher. As a seminarian, that's probably a good thing because that's all I do with my time is read books and write papers. It's a sick addiction, but I like it. And so <laughs> when I learned that I, I get to preach on Mary and Martha, I thought, oh, let's research. So I went to my seminary library, and I picked out gobs of resources, and I found one particular resource that really rocked my world. I think I say that a lot about, about things, but I get excited about really simple things. But this particular text, I want you guys to know, I have to give credit where credit is due, is the text that I will be preaching from primarily. And it's called uh, The New Perspective. I think it'll come up on the screen. The New Perspective on Mary and Martha, written by Mary Hansen. And it says in the tagline, <laughs> do not preach Mary and Martha until you've read this. <laughs> so I was like, okay. Better read that since I'm preaching on Mary and Martha. Um, but what I really appreciate about this theologian's voice is she brings something different to the story. She gives me a different perspective that honestly, in my 33 years of following Jesus, I had never heard this perspective. So I kind of want to give maybe a little bit of a warning. Uh, it might be a different interpretation than you've ever heard before. But I pray, I pray that you receive it with open arms because it's the word of the Lord and the word of the Lord is creative and it speaks to us in different ways and we need different voices to give us a different angle on saying, hey, have you ever thought about it like this? 
So the story of Martha and Mary, uh, it's different to me now. And it might be different to you, but I don't get too freaked out, okay? Because <laughs> I still believe their story is transforming if we allow it. So that's the story we're going to be looking through today. And I've titled this sermon, Knowing Her Role. Knowing Her Role. And I think it's important because one of the main messages that I have learned from this story is that these women, both Martha and Mary, they knew their role as disciples of Jesus Christ. So that's what I've titled it this morning. And before I dive in, what do I want to do? I want to start us off in prayer. So can we pray together? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your kingdom. Thank you that you are more radical than we ever could anticipate. Thank you, God, that you blow apart the social norms, the things that make us feel comfortable and safe, the things that make us feel in control. Jesus, you and your kingdom actually blows them apart. And this story of Martha and Mary is exactly that. So I pray, God, that you would give us ears that are so in tune with your Holy Spirit to hear your message to hear your message of the ways in which you say, my kingdom cannot be confound to social norms. Be with us here, Lord Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, so before I begin, I'm going to begin the story of Martha and Mary. I'm going to begin with a story of yours truly, <laughs> a story of me. So when I was in my 20s, throughout most of my life as a 20-something, I did a lot of youth ministry. I loved it. It was a really, really fun way to serve the kingdom. And uh, I was doing that for many years in every capacity possible. I was a volunteer um, in the suburbs. I was a volunteer here in the cities. And then uh, one day when I was 25 years old, Jesus said, Brianne, I want to take your volunteer, and I want to take you to a full-time ministry ministry status. And I said, super cool, because that full-time ministry status brought me to California. <laughs> Who doesn't love to leave cold Minnesota for California? So I went, unapologetically excited, anticipating for a new way to bring the kingdom of God, and I moved to California. And there's something very interesting that I learned about doing full-time youth ministry. Uh, there's something very interesting I learned about the church uh, in church life, is that just like all of society, the church life has its norms. It has, it has its way of understanding things. It has its way of creating boundaries and saying, you should fit into these boundaries. And when I was throughout my 20s, and now as a 33-year-old woman even still, I was unmarried. I'm, I'm still unmarried. Surprise. Uh, but, but what I learned in my church and what would often happen in church life is I would hear, are you dating? Mm-mm. And, and the response that I would receive were all, was so different. I would either get immediately like, oh, I know this guy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure. Or, um, or sometimes it would be like, are you married? No. Are you dating? Uh-uh. And then they just walk away. Like, I don't know what to do with you because you're, you don't fit this norm that I think that you should fit because you're kind of an older 20-something and you're a Christian and older 20-somethings who are Christians really should be married. This is a norm. And it, let me, before I go any further, let me just say this is just from my experience Okay, this is, this is my experience, and that is the tone that I will be using throughout this message. And so my experience was telling me, like, man, you get asked time and time again if you're married or if you're dating, and you start to think, like, I'm missing something, I guess. I guess there is a norm. I guess there is this hidden code that says, unless you are married, you must not really be satisfied. Unless you are married, you must not really be uh, fulfilling your role as a disciple of Jesus. Brianna, are you married? No. Are you dating? No. Well, I know this other guy. It's like, oh. But what these, these friends didn't understand, and I, I trust that their motives were pure. I really do. But my experience would, would wrestle with it, right? Because I always thought, like, I'm not married, and, and I'm not dating, but I honestly feel so firmly this really radical spirit of contentment in that. And my heart is saying, like, Jesus, you have me here. <laughs> yes, amen. And so when you keep hearing, like, that's the first thing people want to know about you, and they're trying to fix that, I'm at war, right? I'm at this inner tension of, like, but I actually think I'm called to this season of singleness right now, and why are you trying to rush me out of it? Because I don't fit your norm? Sorry, <laughs> I'm going to rock this thing as long as God wants me to. Yes, yes. Breaking the norms needs to happen both inside the church and outside of the church. Amen. Oh, <laughs> yeah, cool. And Jesus does that. 
Jesus breaks the social norms because we have a tendency, my friends, to be conformed to the patterns of this world. And the patterns of this world, if you are not married by the time you are 20-something, well, you better hurry up because 30 is looming. And if you're not married by the time you're 30, something's really wrong with you. The, the pond is getting smaller and smaller. But let us break these social norms. And we have so many norms and social codes that we try to adhere because it makes us feel in control and it makes us feel like I'm normal and you're not. So with that story, I wonder, do we not all maybe have some experiences with this? Maybe your situation with you know, being challenged by the social norms isn't so much because of your relationship status, but maybe you're choosing to live your life a little bit differently. Maybe you say, you know what, I don't need to own a big fancy home. Maybe I don't need to own a big fancy home full of fancy things. Maybe I don't need to follow life in this very certain structure. And my friends, I want to encourage that because I think the kingdom does not adhere to the social norms. And the story of Martha and Mary is one such example of Jesus coming and saying, I know there's a lot of cultural norms that people will try to keep me in, but I'm going to break through them. And I know that women have been having to stay conformed to cultural norms for so long, but I'm going to break through those and draw these women out. So this is the story of Martha and Mary. And the story of Martha and Mary is found in two different Gospels, the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Luke. And today I chose to read from the Gospel of Luke for no significant reason, really. So um, this is what we will be reading from. And before I read the story of Martha and Mary, I believe that it is important to read the surrounding texts, right? Because stories don't exist in and of themselves. They belong in other stories. And so what we see in, in Luke chapter 10... We see that what happens before we come to the story of Martha and Mary is this. We see the mission of the 70. So the beginning of chapter 10 is Jesus sending out all of Jesus' disciples to say, hey, I came to bring the kingdom, and I'm going to send you out to expand that kingdom even more. So we know immediately because the chapter that the story of Martha and Mary belongs in begins with a mission. So the story of Martha and Mary is really a story about mission. The story of Martha and Mary is really a story about ministry. And if we go back just a few chapters earlier, we see like, you know what? The disciples is not limited to just men, which I think is often a common belief. I lecture at a, a Christian institution close to here, and I teach Christian theology. And I remember what it's like to be a young, budding theologian. I, I still am, even though I've been doing it for what seems like forever. Um, is you have these assumptions. And some of my students will articulate uh, one of the reasons for uh, male hierarchy is because Jesus only chose male disciples. <laughs> and I had that same idea. I had that same perspective. Like, well, there was only 12 disciples and they were all boys, so that tells me something. But what I forgot is like, oh, there's this chapter here called Luke chapter 8, and it says that some women accompanied Jesus. <laughs> so I guess Jesus had female disciples too. That's super gnarly. And so we see that the story of Martha and Mary belongs in a missional context, and this missional context has both women and men disciples. Amen. So, yeah. All right, so here we go. I'm going to read this story for you. And again, because I like things done in community, you are free to read aloud if you want. You are free to read it in your own mind. I'm going to read it aloud, though. So here we go. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken from her. Amen. So one of the reasons why I'm excited to preach this story is because I think that it rescues Martha from the ways in which Martha has commonly been understood. Poor Martha, I think over the generations, she's kind of been tossed under the, under the bus too many times. Martha's the one who got it wrong. Martha's the one who's so disorganized and, and distracted by her household tasks of things like, I don't know, baking bread and washing the dishes and cleaning the floor that she's not really worshiping and following Jesus, but Mary gets it right. So therefore, Mary's response is worth more than Martha's. But my friends, thanks to my, my theologian friend, I see something different. Because this interpretation of Martha and Mary allows us to receive beautiful truths from both women. 
from both Martha and Mary have something to tell us. And I'm excited to share that with you today. So before we dive into the story of Martha and Mary, I think there's a few things we need to know. Not just where in Scripture does this story lie, but in what context was this story written? And so to fully understand this story, at least a little bit more, we should put on our first century Jewish glasses because that's when this story takes place. And so there's a few things I want us to know about first century life. First of all, it is this. Uh, society was structured around this system of honor and shame. Okay, honor, shame, system. Honor was a very limited resource in those days. And it was your highest priority to keep that honor if you even had the luck of having it to begin with. And so your aim, especially as the male in the family, was to keep the honor of your family because you wanted your family name to be tethered to that. And if something happened in your family, if, say, a daughter acted outside of the ways in which she should act, shame would then come upon your house. These were the cultural codes, the social norms, this honor-shame system. And you better, not, for, you better not mess it up. You better not get rid of your honor because otherwise shame will come upon your house. And that is disastrous for your family name. So that's one big thing is this honor-shame system. And it structured all of society life. So that was one big thing. Another thing is males and females had their very set roles. Men were the ones who could be disciples. In Jewish culture, we, you had things called rabbis, right? The Jewish rabbis. And those Jewish rabbis would have disciples. And very traditionally, it was only women who were allowed, or no, it wasn't. It was only men who were allowed to be disciples. It's not that it was against the law or something like that for, for women to be disciples, but it just was frowned upon. It was not encouraged in any way, shape, or form. So traditionally, you only saw males sitting at the feet of their rabbi. Women didn't have such a role. And I think that right there, the story of Martha and Mary, tells us something different. So those are a few first century points that I want us to understand, that there is a huge honor-shame system, that there is a social norm, there is a certain way of doing things. And part of that honor-shame system, males had to act a certain way, and females had to act a certain way. Like it was incredibly shameful for a woman to be seen in public with a man that she was not related to. That was a big no-no. That was a doozy. And so we see something different in the story of Martha and Mary, that even that code was broken by Jesus. And so with that, I want to dig in a little bit more into the story of Martha and Mary to see the ways in which the kingdom breaks through these cultural norms. And what do we know? Well, well the story starts off by saying, now they went on their way. So it starts off as a plural. They, who? Well, all the disciples that Jesus sent out, right? All the disciples that Jesus sent out on a mission. They kept going on their way. But he entered a certain village. So Jesus breaks from the crowd. Jesus breaks from the mission of all these disciples. And he alone goes to a house of Martha and Mary. And that's important for a couple of reasons. But the first thing that we notice is that Martha opens the door for Jesus and welcomes him in. And if we go back to the beginning of the chapter, when Jesus sends the, the disciples out, Jesus tells them, like, don't carry a purse, don't carry a bag. If you go to a house and they welcome you, stay there. And so if somebody welcomes you into their home, it's this idea, right, that they are receiving you as a disciple of Jesus. And they're probably receiving you as a disciple of Jesus because they too have received Jesus. They're opening their door to you and they are saying like, you are coming with the good news of Jesus Christ. I know that good news of Jesus Christ and I am welcoming you and you get to stay here and I will take care of you. So there's this idea, right? When Martha opens the door to Jesus, Martha, we know then, is already a disciple because she opened the door and she received Jesus and she had received the message of Jesus. So that's our two big points that we can get right away from the very beginning of this story. But we also see something different. Jesus, an unmarried dude, goes into the house of two unmarried women. You think about that, that is like dodgy, like what's going to happen? <laughs> Jesus, this unmarried man, goes to the home of two unmarried ladies. That is like, you just don't do that because that brings forth all sorts of assumptions, doesn't it? But Jesus broke that social norm and said, there are disciples and I have a message for them and I'm going to stay with them. So, Mary, our Martha opens the door for Jesus. Jesus comes in. 
And the story continues, and we see that Martha is distracted by her many tasks. Martha is distracted by many tasks. Now, this is where interpretations for generations have tossed Martha under the bus and saying, look at her, she's so distracted, she's not even paying attention to Jesus because she's baking the bread and washing the dishes. But my friends, I don't think that that's the case. And this is where the new interpretation starts to take root. Because what it says in, is that Martha was distracted by her many tasks. And it wasn't just these, these meaningless tasks, but rather it is more um, best understood as like activities perhaps even more understood as ministries. Martha had already received the message of Jesus. Martha was a disciple, and Martha had many tasks that demanded her attention, and these tasks were her mission. These tasks were her adventure of being a disciple of Jesus. And these tasks apparently kept her close to the home. Her particular mission kept her close to the home. And we also know that Martha was an unmarried woman. Mary was an unmarried woman. They also had a brother named Lazarus. But Martha was the oldest of the family. So she was kind of in charge of the home. She was the, the, the leader, if you will, of the house. So she's distracted by all of these tasks. And she's bothered. She's concerning herself with her sister Mary. And this is where our new interpretation goes a little bit deeper. And it showed me something totally new. Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me? Don't you care that my sister has left me? Has left me. Now, one of the things that my theologian friend pointed out to me is that this story uh, does not give Mary a voice. When we read through the story, we do not hear the voice of Mary at all, do we? Mary's not interacting with this dialogue. Martha doesn't ask Mary, Mary, why are you just sitting there like a disciple? Why don't you come help me? Because I have all these ministries that I'm distracted and anxious by. Mary has no voice. Why? Because she's not there. The first time I heard that, I was like, what? What? I've never heard that before. But this theologian is contending, and when I look through this story a little bit more closely, I think, oh my gosh, she's right. Mary's not even there. Mary also received the message of Jesus, and her mission and her ministry took her out of the home. She had her own mission to do, and she was out doing it. She had left Martha to do her own ministries and to bring her own mission, but Martha apparently was so concerned and anxious about how Mary was doing it. And don't we do that all the time? Aren't we always distracted by that? Like, they're not doing it right. Why have they left me to do all the work by myself? They should be back here where I can be in control and where they're the ones who are helping me. Who cares that maybe God called me to be a missionary and a minister in my own home, but my sister gets to be sent off into the dusty roads and she should not be there. But Jesus is saying, hold up, Martha. He's not rebuking Martha's ministry. Let us keep that. He is not rebuking Martha's ministry. He simply addresses the fact that she's worried the fact that she's distracted because her sister's off doing something different. So Jesus says to her so oh, compassionately, Martha, Martha, basically, daughter, don't worry about it. You have your mission, and you do that. But Mary, my disciple, she has her own mission, and she is out doing it, and that will not be taken away from her. Amen. And I think this is what we see. This is the way in which Jesus comes, and this is the way in which Jesus expands his kingdom. It's done in all sorts of different ways. Martha, don't you dare be concerned with how Mary's doing her mission. Rather, focus on your own. And do, do you guys ever notice that? When you start to become anxious and, and worried or distracted by how the other people are doing their mission, how then can you be fully focused on your own? How then can you be a good steward and be totally faithful to the ways in which God is calling you to be God's pers kingdom person? It's when we start to look at other people, and it doesn't matter if you are looking at them saying like, gosh, they really need to be back here, but maybe you're looking through the lens of comparison. Maybe you're thinking like, I really wish I was more like that person. I really wish I had that gifting because they are apparently bringing the kingdom of God more, and I'm so distracted and worried about how they're doing that I'm forgetting the ways in which Jesus created me to bring the kingdom. And maybe I just need to be more focused on me and how God created me and how God is calling me to bring the kingdom. And so Jesus is saying to her, Martha, Martha, don't worry about it, girl. You have your own mission. And so by Jesus, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Clap, amen to that one. You have your own mission. Jesus never rebuked Martha's tasks. 
And by not rebuking Martha's tasks, what Jesus is doing, therefore, is affirming her tasks and saying, I have created you to do this, and I want you to do it well. And the way to do that well is, girlfriend, you've got to focus on your own tasks. Don't worry what Mary is doing, for she's chosen what is better. And what is that which is better? Well, she's simply out there doing her own mission. She is owning it, unapologetically owning it and saying, Jesus is calling me out. I'm going to go, homie. I am going to go no matter how many cultural norms this breaks. Mary wasn't supposed to go out because we know when we put on our first century Jewish glasses that women were supposed to stay close to the home. Well, Jesus breaks cultural norms time and again. And if we read back again in Luke chapter 8, it says that many women accompanied Jesus. So already we see a disruption in the social norms. This would have brought so much shame upon their home. But Jesus says, even that I'm going to break. Even that I am going to break. We see time and again Jesus breaking cultural boundaries and cultural codes in order that God's kingdom might come a little bit more fully. And I love that. And it makes me terribly uncomfortable. It really does. It really does. Because in my own context, the story of my own life, my experience was, I guess I need to get married. I guess I need to bear children. And I was distracted by that. And I would pray over that. Like, Lord, why isn't this happening? Because I'm not fitting some cultural norm that apparently I'm supposed to fit. And Jesus kept saying to me, Brianna, Brianna, own the fact that I have you here. And and it was interesting because I could then lean a little bit more fully into the fact like, why am I distracted by this? I actually have a wild sense of contentment in it. (laughs) Why would I want to change that? Why would I want to change that? I'm going to own the fact that this is the mission that God has me on. I'm not going to distract myself by other people and how they think I need to be bringing the kingdom of God. Because my friends, what I have learned when I allow the Lord to work fully wherever God has me, that what I think isn't fitting some social norm will be the very thing that God uses to bring God's kingdom even more. I'm not married, but you know what that allowed me to do? I was living in Minneapolis at the time, and Jesus says, Brianna, let's do youth ministry full time. I was gone. (laughs) I was gone. I had nothing keeping me here. So I said, okay, let's go. I packed up my little car, Maisie, and I was on the road, and I was gone. I want to own the mission and the ministry that God has me on. And this is what Martha and Mary can teach us. Martha's role in activities in ministry is no less than Mary's. And that is something that I want to highlight again. No matter what your role is, Martha's role kept her close to home. I grew up in a home where my mom was a stay-at-home mom. And if my mom did not fulfill that role, which was, I believe, her calling in life, I wonder where I would be. Because as a kid, I got to hear my mom. And as a kid, I got to have fresh baked cookies when I got home. And actually, that might seem like a meaningless thing. But when you're a kid, that is like, this is my mom. And she cares for me so much. And she fulfilled her mission that kept her close to home. I have lots of sisters who have children. And they have chosen the mission of staying at home. So my friends, if you are a stay-at-home spouse, if you are a stay-at-home parent, you own that role. And I don't care how many people say to you, you're actually not contributing to society. And I want to say, yes, you are, because you are being faithful to your role. You are being faithful, so you raise those children as best as you can. Or maybe your mission calls you out. Maybe your mission calls you to California. Maybe your mission calls you to corporate life. Maybe your mission calls you to wash dishes. Maybe it calls you to be a guard. I don't don't care what it is. Whatever it is, do it for the glory of the Lord and own it and rock it. I mean, look, look back in the corner. We have arts. We have gobs of arts there. We have so many artists in this community. And what if those artists did not receive their mission? What if those artists said, I don't know, artists are kind of, you know, quirky and I don't really understand them and people don't really understand them. I should go be a business person and said, oh, no, no, own it. Own it. If Jesus is calling you to be an artist and if you have that gifting, please fulfill your role and your mission as an artist because you know what? You are speaking to me in a way that I could not speak otherwise. So, my friends, the story of Martha and Mary tells us there are all sorts of ways to bring the kingdom of Jesus. The story of Martha and Mary is a missional story, and they each have their different roles, and Jesus is not going to take any of them away. So what are our take-home points? What can we learn from this story of Martha and Mary? I think there's a few things. The first one is this. Reject societal rules in favor of the codes of the kingdom. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Reject societal rules in favor of the codes of the kingdom because the codes of the kingdom are totally different 
than the codes of society. Our citizenship belongs to the kingdom, not here. Our citizenship is elsewhere. We see Jesus time and again breaking the codes of society. The first, like he goes into a home of two women as an unmarried man. He broke that social code in order that he could encourage his disciples. Nothing will stop Jesus, not even social codes that say this is how you're to act. So you better adhere to that. Jesus says, no, I'm going to break these societal norms in honor and for the sake of my kingdom. A second take-home point is this. Do not worry, rather pray. Do not worry, rather pray. Because the story of Martha and Mary, the the immediate story that comes after it is the Lord's Prayer. And so when we continue to understand that stories are best understood in their context and the other surrounding stories around them, well, if Jesus sends out the, the 70 disciples and that comes before the story of Martha and Mary, we know then that the story of Martha and Mary is missional. And what comes after the story of Martha and Mary? Jesus' prayer. So we know that prayer matters in being on mission. Don't worry about your mission and don't worry about how other people are doing their mission. Instead, pray. Pray, pray. Seek first the kingdom of God, scripture tells us. And it's going to be hard, and I think that this actually has to be a really important thing to our ministries, to our ministries, because when we are breaking social codes, it's going to be uncomfortable. We're going to second guess ourselves. I continue to rock my footsteps of being an unmarried woman, and that is still going against social codes. But what I have to do, I have to not be concerned with that. Instead, I have to pray and say, Jesus, you have me here. Please keep my focus on that because I want to be faithful in the mission that you have for me. Do not worry, rather pray. A third point of take home that we can learn from this story is this. Be faithful to your adventure of discipleship. Be faithful to your adventure. If you are an artist, you be the best artist that you can possibly be, and you bring the kingdom in a way that non-artists cannot bring. No matter what your adventure is, if you are a stay-at-home parent, be the best stay-at-home parent that you can because your, your parenting matters and your parenting has an effect on the kingdom. If you are a CEO, be the best CEO you can be. If you are a seminary student, then I'm going to be the best seminary student that I can be because this is the adventure that God has me on. Be faithful to it, my friends, because it all matters in significance. The last and final take-home point is this. Support and celebrate the adventures of disciples. No matter what it is, it will probably look different than your own. Do not keep it confined to some social norm. Don't. And said, support it and celebrate and say, you, you're going to do that? There are so many things in life that I could never do. I am wildly disorganized. And so when I think about people who have incredible administrative tasks, I look at you and I'm like, you're so smart. How do you do it? I will support you and I will celebrate you and your ability to organize. I don't get how you do it. And you know what? I'm going to support you and celebrate because you can help me because I don't have that gift. Support and celebrate the adventures of others. Because when we do that, when we own our own role, when we own our own ministries, and when we then come alongside of our brothers and sisters and say, dude, the way you're bringing the kingdom, that's really cool. It's different than what I'm doing, but it's really cool. Do you know how much more the kingdom of God is going to come? Amen. I want the kingdom of God to come fully. I want it to come creatively, and I want it to come because it already does in ways that I do not expect it. It will break societal norms, but Martha and Mary say, that's okay. Because Jesus calls us to lots of different places. Because Jesus cares about bringing God's kingdom in its fullest. And in a way that brings life. In a way that does not keep keep people confined. But in ways that frees people from their societal norms. So, with these take... Oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah! (laughs) I heard you. (laughs) That is the kingdom of God, and this is Jesus saying, I'm breaking social norms because there are women on the outside, and they matter to my kingdom, and I'm going to bring them on the inside. Amen. My friends, let us pray. Let us pray as we go out and as the worship team comes up for a little bit more worship. Father God, you disrupt me. You totally disrupt me. And I can get really uncomfortable and, and uh, disturbed because I don't really get how your kingdom comes because it doesn't live in according and it's not brought in accordance with society and culture. But Jesus, I also want to say thank you for doing that because the way in which you do things, that brings liberation. Because the way in which you do things, Jesus, that frees people from oppression. Jesus, the way in which your kingdom comes, comes from the margins 
and it rescues those that have been cast to the outside. Jesus, may you fill us with strength and courage to live into our ministries and missions more fully, no matter what it is. Give us the strength and the courage to just own it. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that you've called us on mission, and thank you that you approve and acknowledge and say yes to all the different ministries out there. We pray these things in your radical, outrageous name. Amen.